stage for what we're going to be discussing this morning. I now have the pleasure of introducing um, our on the ground view panel. These are spouses and uh, folks that really have been working with family members uh, to raise their resilience and make sure that um, we continue to be Army strong. With us we have today Mrs. Melissa Seligman, an Army spouse and founder of the very popular blog Her War, Her Voice. We also have Mr. Wayne Perry, also an Army spouse and founder of Manning the Homefront, a group for male spouses. We have Mrs. Jill Kreider, spouse of Colonel Jim Kreider, and a recent graduate of the Master Resilience Program, so that's perfect there. And Dr. Glenn Scaraldi, who has served on the stress management faculties at the Pentagon, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, and the University of Maryland School of Public Health. So we're going to begin with Melissa. Melissa? Thank you so much for having me here today. It's an honor, and thank you, Patty, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm happy to be here in a family forum talking about the challenges and the triumphs. Two years ago, my husband returned from his third deployment. It was his second to Iraq, and it was the first time I thought he might not come home. Perhaps it was because I knew what could happen to him. I'd seen firsthand what an attack looked like for him, I'd heard his stories about the bodies, the bombs, all the blood. Perhaps it was because I knew what to expect for myself. I knew that we would have spotty communication, blackouts. My children would be crying, hoping for a father to come home, a father I could not produce. And I knew he would come back and we would have a vast canyon of silence that would encompass us if he came home. That deployment, I chose to unleash my fear and begin to fully live and breathe. That year, Christina Piper and I began Her War, Her Voice. There, I blogged through my good, my bad, my sometimes pretty ugly, and my dark. He did come home. He was changed. And I welcomed him with open arms, a very different woman. We struggled as so many of us struggled. And we worked very hard to get back to the point where we felt like we were we again. We were us again. I eased out of the bed when he thrashed through his nightmares. I touched his sweaty face in hopes of bringing him home from war. I watched as he retreated into his darkness and I sat helpless. And I begged my heart not to harden as I pleaded for a way through. When we became more than either of us could bear, we got help. We both went to counseling, which is the best choice I've ever made, by the way. We found other spouses and other people who were willing to talk with us and help us through by sharing their journey. We did the hard work to help each other come out of a year of torturous pain. That was our third deployment reintegration. And that's what so many of us have come to expect in reintegration. But what if there's so much more to it? What if we begin to look at reintegration beyond the short time we have between multiple deployments? What if we have enough time to breathe, enough time to think? Perhaps reintegration back into sustaining life rather than avoiding death is the deep dark issue we all face as we begin to come out of two decade long wars. I know how to reintegrate between deployments. I know how to help him settle. I know all the fun ways to learn to communicate with each other again. I finally learned how to release my role, <laughs> my job as two parents, and let him settle in again. In fact, I created a pretty successful blog about it. But what happens when I had time to really think about what happened to me? How does that reintegration play out? When we moved to Fort Jackson last year, and I knew he wouldn't be deployed again for a while, I expected to finally find our family life again. I hoped to put to bed all that we had been through and to see the light at the end of the tunnel. For me, that light didn't come, at least not for a while. In fact, one year after his return, I found myself in the depths of darkness again, but this time it was darker and it was deeper. 
I didn't have what I thought was a normal excuse. I wasn't enduring a deployment. I wasn't helping my sweet babies as they cried to sleep each night. I wasn't waiting on a phone call, and I certainly wasn't waiting on that dreaded knock at the door. I wasn't in the darkness for what I considered an honorable reason. And because of that, I felt incredibly selfish, and I felt like a failure. I was consumed with one question. What is wrong with me? While it seemed life went on around me, I stood still wondering, what happened to the woman I used to be? How could he be home, safe and sound, and how can my family be so happy? And I can hardly get out of the bed. Thus began a new reintegration for me, learning to live again. No, these wars are not over, and we don't have much time between deployments to begin to take stock of what's happened to us. But what happens when we do? What do we have in place? What happens when we have time to think about what's happened to us, the families, the spouses, the girlfriends, the boyfriends, the fiancés? What happens when we take the time to really find out where we have gone? What happens when we have reprieve, only to find our trauma is waiting to embrace us, and it is dramatic, waiting for someone to come home for more. Many of us discuss this, and I've heard it whispered on the lips of those who could predict what will happen after years of sustaining war. But what happens when it gets pushed down so deep that it becomes merely a whisper? What happens when the fear of what now takes hold? For me, and for many other spouses out there, what happens is panic and worry and fear. I'm not okay. We are not okay. Saying it out loud becomes almost petrifying, and trust me, I am shaking. <laughs> but I'm here today to say it out loud. I'm here today to remove the fear. I'm here to ask all of us to begin to do the hard work, to say it out loud and begin to unite the fight and fight the, insulation, the isolation and the fear. I realize I am just a spouse. I'm not a business guru. I'm not a counselor. I'm not a CEO of some prestigious company. I am a woman who loves a man who went to war. But I am not alone. Today I tell you my story and my fear what happened to me when I felt so alone and full of pain I wasn't sure where to go? I did reach out, and there I found another military spouse. I found hope. I found light again. And this is my story. This is my battle that I fight every day. But today I bring with me the voices of those who are ready to be heard, those who have been in the darkness and are choosing to find a way through. I realize we have so many resources and so many ways for spouses to seek help, and they are so valuable. But until our spouses feel heard, until they feel like they're not alone, until they know their fears and worries are not selfish, will they reach out? We all know the stories, and we've all cried from losing another to, su to suicide. We all know what happens when someone feels completely alone. Every day I get emails from spouses in pain. I recently took a week off to lead a spouse retreat in Montana, and I came home to over 700 emails, many of them completely lost. This has to change. We are tracking those in uniform and watching their war warning signs, but what about our spouses? Let me here today to bring you their voices and their story. Every day, up to 16 veterans commit suicide. Who is keeping track of their spouses? These are their voices. The words were there all along. I kept them chained 
my back turned, ears covered, eyes shut tight, then hit my stride, began to breathe, let down my guard. They were waiting, simmering there in the dark to seize the day and forge the crack in my defense, striking furiously without mercy. They laid me broken, bleeding, prostrate, screaming, whimpering in anguish and despair. I cannot do this anymore. I struggled not to hear, to block them out, to flee. They were relentless, determined to be reckoned, delighting in their voice, bathing over me with their poison. You cannot do this. You have failed. The words have left their mark. Still, clinging to my last reserve, I hear familiar voices pleading through the den. Four tiny, trusting eyes. My one true love, my friend, all beckon. Stay with me. You have a choice. Hearkening to the hopeful voice, I choose to stand and greet the light, however dim to rise and dress the wound, replace their chains, and start again, to live the story to its end. There's more beyond the dark. Try to pretend we aren't in pain, aren't exhausted from all these years of deployments is foolish. Worse yet, it's dangerous. This doesn't help anyone deal with these real emotions. So there wasn't just one thing that drew me to that edge. It was a lot of little things, and I just couldn't handle it anymore. I did try to end my life. If you are thinking about taking your life, just wait. There are days that I still feel like a failure every day. It doesn't mean that I won't get up tomorrow. A friend went dark, as we say. We called, we texted her, and told her that we'd keep it up. She got mad. That's fine by me. She has to be alive to be mad. I was very close to death at my own hands. And at my own hands, I'm making sure that I'm still here and I'm still willing to take on the fight. You are not alone. Ever. All you need to do is reach out, share, call for us and we will be there. It could be one of my proudest moments, knowing that military spouses trusted me enough to tell their stories and bring their artwork and to give a piece of themselves like that. It's a beautiful thing. And today I'm asking you to join me and, and to join them in the hard work. I'm not asking for a new program. I'm not asking for funding. But what I am asking you to do is stand with me and with them, not just today or even tomorrow, but every day. Until no one else is, feels alone, no one else is in the darkness, and no one else has to wonder what now. There is no clear path forward in reintegrating back into life when war has been all we've known for years, especially when we are still fighting. But together, Hand in hand, voice to voice, we can begin to remove the fear, and I believe in this. And I hope after seeing that, you do too. Remove the darkness, remove the feelings of isolation and alienation. None of us may know what is next. None of us can answer that burning question of what now. But what we can do is begin to search together in the light. I'm asking you today to make a choice, to reach out, choose to listen, choose to speak and fight the fears, and choose to say the two words to that one person who's been craving and hoping to hear them from you, me too. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa Wayne.
Good morning, everybody. It's a little hard for me to transition from what Melissa just talked about because it, what she said is so near and dear to my heart. Um, I call Melissa my Yoda because uh, she's talked me off that ledge several times. Um, I've, I, I'm really proud to call her a friend, and I have been on that ledge in my own way. So it, I knew I was going to be nervous coming up here, so I need y'all's help to help me not be nervous. When our soldiers have something to agree on, or they got that hua thing, I'm not a soldier, so I can't do that. So what I need you all to do is I want to know, can I get a whoop whoop? <laughs> Thank you. Now, anytime throughout what I'm saying, you feel the need to say that, please go ahead. It'll make me feel a lot more comfortable. I am a male military spouse. No, I do not have horns. Woo, yeah, all right. Believe it or not, we are out there, and there is a growing number of us. There is, right now, in the Army, a little over 36,000 male military spouses. This does include dual military. Uh, so that leaves about 20,000 of us that are civilian male spouses. But where do we go? What do we have for our community? We know the resiliency in the Army is key. We understand battle buddies it's what you green suitors have. You have your battle buddy. The military spouses, the military wives, they have their battle buddy. They've embraced that. We don't have that. We're kind of just left out there. But we know the resiliency is key to making a successful marriage work in the military. We make up 9% of the marriages in the military, but we make up for 34% of the divorces. I'm going to say that again so it really resonates. 9% of the marriages, 34% of the divorces. That's a staggering number to me, and I just I can't wrap my head around it. I'm sorry. Can I get a woo-woo? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I want to put it in a different way. Imagine if you have two battalions that are identical. They both have 1,000 soldiers. One battalion is receiving 20 casualties. One battalion is receiving 80 casualties. And there's no answer for why. And that's what we're seeing in the marriages of our female service members. Because this isn't really about the male military spouse. It's about our service member and their family. So where are we going to send these guys? What are we going to do for them? When my wife first joined the Army, I started looking online for all sorts of resources. And I joined in the choir of men who have come before me and said, there is nothing for me. Not one of these resources is for me. And then I had an epiphany and a few kicks in the butt by some good friends. And I was told, those resources are for everybody. And it really dawned on me, they are for everybody. And it wasn't resources I wanted, it was community. I became a stay-at-home dad. And that transition from the breadwinner Crumb, crumb winner, we only, I only hate crumbs. <laughs> From that role, owning my own business, having my own freedom, to all of a sudden having a nine-month-old to take care of, that was a hard transition for me to make. And it is for many men. And we're seeing more women join the ranks these days than we have before. With the military now opening up different MOSs, there's probably going to be even a higher number of women joining and we need to be prepared for that we need to find a way for us guys to have a community of our own so that we can be part of the military community when you go to a FRG meeting or a spouse group meeting they are predominantly women and I used to say that there was no resources for men but now I believe it's that we are just underrepresented we don't have enough men standing up to do things like this and speak on our behalf. But we also have a generation of men that are in their 30s that were told, do not come to this spouse event because you were a man. Do not come to this commander's coffee. I understand your wife is a captain, but you are not welcome here because you were a man. You're going to make the other ladies feel uncomfortable. 
And that has happened. We have a whole generation of guys who will not participate because they were told they were not allowed to participate. And that has changed. I've only been in doing this for two and a half years. I have never experienced that. But friends, I don't want to play bunko either. <laughs> I sure don't want to do it in my pajamas. <laughs> you know, when, when our soldiers go off to war, we see the resiliency and the, and the, the group come together. I was listening to uh, the folks from Mary to the Army, the show that's going to be on the OWN network yesterday speak, and one of the ladies had said, you know, the, the soldiers have a fraternity, and that fraternity over the last couple decades has welcomed their sisters in arms in. The military spouse community, I believe, has welcomed us in, but there's still that separation. When we send our soldier off to war, I can't go hang out on the couch with some guy's wife on a Friday night. We can't get together like some of the spouses do. To an extent, you can. When my wife deployed, I wasn't really ready for it. We went through 18 out of the first 21 months of our military life separated. And I started looking into those resources and going to the, to the play groups. It took three weeks at a play group before anybody would even speak to me. We have men who are telling stories of going to play groups that are mothers of preschoolers types groups that are told, you aren't welcome here because you're a guy. We have to find a way to build the resiliency in these guys, and that's going to come from doing it with one another, sharing life, uh, the iron sharpens iron mentality. It's a little hard for me to call up. I'm going to call you out, Captain. Would you like to come over to my house and watch Wow Wow Wubsy and play blocks? <laughs> I don't think he would. And that is one of the struggles that a lot of us guys who are being the primary caregiver to our children face, is we don't necessarily fit in with the ladies. We don't necessarily fit in with the soldiers. Man, it was awesome walking around here and seeing all of those armored vehicles and tanks and all that stuff. That was really cool, but I was really hoping for some Pampered Chef products and, <laughs> and some things that I could relate to. <laughs> what we've done with Manning the Home Front is we've created a place for guys to get together. I wish I could tell you, send the guys to Manning the Home Front, but I can't in all honesty, because I can't even organize my sock drawer, let alone an organization that is supposed to reach male military spouses across the globe, because we see these guys, they want to get involved. They want to be reached. <laughs> Thank you. Manning the home front, what we've done is we've brought guys together and we've seen the resiliency being built. We see guys getting together to brew beer, to play golf, to grab a burger, to go to a ball game. That's what we're finding, and that's, what, that's the community. That's the resiliency. You don't necessarily get the counseling from another guy by sitting down and actually having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Maybe it's on the way to the ball game. Maybe it's at the ball game. I do now want to thank AUSA for bringing us out here, because this is the first time that male military spouses have had a voice on a large stage. And I had said that 2012 would be the year of the man spouse. I call us man spouses. Because we have this year made so many strides. We have seen machospouse.com launch, a resource for male military spouses. We have Jeremy Hilton, our military spouse of the year. We have Manning the Home Front, growing by leaps and bounds. And here we are today. And beyond thanking AUSA, I need to thank Fort Riley, because we have tried to bring our group to other installations, and we find that red tape. And that's the red tape we've got to get rid of. We're just a regular bunch of guys. And I want to leave you all with this. This sums up how I feel about us, what us guys need. And this is from the book Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. 
he says, yes, we need men to who we can bear our souls, but it isn't going to happen with a group of guys you don't trust who really aren't willing to go to battle with you. It's a long-standing truth that there is never a more devoted group of men than those who have fought alongside one another, the men of your squadron, the guys in your foxhole. It will never be a large group. But we don't need a large group. We need a band of brothers willing to shed their blood with us. And that's what we need, folks. We need to find a way to get these guys involved in the, with each other so that they can become part of this military community, this wonderful military community. And don't let it slip from your mind that we make up 9% of the marriages and 34% of the divorces. That's staggering. Thank you. Can we get one more woot woot for Wayne? <laughs> and now please, um, Jill Crider will join us. Well, I knew this was going to be hard, but following these two, I didn't realize it was going to be quite this hard. So um, let me tell you, um, I know what you're thinking. What could I possibly have to say after these two guys? Because um, they've certainly established the fact that what we do is hard. Um, it's not just this life, though. It's just life. So granted trying to live normally in extremely abnormal circumstances and situations day to day is overwhelming. And that's exactly where I found myself a couple, after a couple of tough deployments, completely overwhelmed. So, so see if this sounds familiar to anyone, spreading yourself too thin, uh, doing too much, experiencing traumatic events, whether it be military with my husband's unit or even personal Incidents. I fell down a staircase. I fell, got bit by a brown recluse spider. You know, got a six-year-old. All that stuff. Not all that would have happened anyway, whether he was deployed or not. It's just life, but it just seemed to expound a little bit. So anyway, all that going on, still trying to maintain perfect balance. I'm good. I'm up. I'm good. I'm good. Shaking my head. I'm good. So, but frankly, it was just a personal recipe for disaster. <laughs> so, I've never been an especially patient person in the first place, but after years of waiting, I think I've managed to master patience. However, it left me with zero tolerance, no tolerance whatsoever. Um, the smallest aggravation would send me to the rooftop a lot, frequently, and without much warning, and knowing that I had to find a way to change it. So about the same time, I began hearing the term resilience, resilience, resilience. But no one could explain to me what exactly it was. No one could explain why they thought it was the thing that might help me. And I figured I was pretty resilient, right? I mean, I'd been through some long days, and I was still good. I'm, I'm resilient. Uh, no, not at all, actually. So I decided to take the friend's advice and attend the course. But the truth was, I wasn't going to get help. I was going so that I could write about it and tell you all why it wasn't the right answer. It wasn't going to be the thing that helped me. So I went, kicking and screaming in my head, but I went. And looking back, I should probably retake the first day and a half of the class because I was like, oh, not me, not me, not listening, not, no, 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 not me. Been there a couple times. So. As my luck would have it, and for those of you that have attended the training, you know what I'm about to say. Afternoon of the second day of my class, I had a what? Activating event. And I mean, it was all systems go, full boosters on, to the ceiling, on the rooftop, okay? It's not really important now what the event was that sent me on to the ceiling, but that it would have been an all day actually a three-day bender for me. It would have been three days before I clenched my fist, took a deep breath, focused on what I needed to happen, and began to exhale. What a tremendous waste of time and energy and emotion. So there I was in the middle of my disaster, and I thought, well, let's just see if this stuff works like they say it does. 
So I started with the A. Okay, activating event. Okay, this is what happened. Yep, still makes me mad. I'm mad about this. I'm always mad about this. This is my iceberg. I'm mad. And then the T, think about your thoughts. And the first thing you need to know is never go with that first thought. It's always the bad one. Burning down the house, not the good answer. <laughs> not it. So just take that first one and go, okay, that's the wrong answer. Let's go, what's my next thing? So the thinking and the thoughting and all that kind of thing and why it's making you nuts. And then the C, the consequences. What's going to happen if I burn down the house? What's going to happen if I run the car through the garage? Um, and the consequences. And what do I want those? What's the outcome that I want to occur? And frankly, I'm going to be very honest with you. By the time I get to the A and to the C, I've most of the time forgotten what it was I was mad about in the first place. But it works. So anyway, here I am, walking my dog in the middle of my disaster, and just like a tumblers and a lock, boom, 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 boom. I was done. Over. I even tried like going back and getting mad again, like, are you sure? Yeah, I'm good. Two hours. Two hours, I was done, moving on. That's huge. That changed the dinner conversation that night. <laughs> that changed how my kid went to bed that night. Huge. So anyhow, what's the bottom line? I want to, as Ms. Chandler said, I want to encourage you to take the course. I'm excited to hear that it's on every post. That wasn't the case when I took the course, and that is exciting news. Um, so first of all, definitely, if you have an opportunity, and I did the five-day, 40-hour, gut-it-out, do-it-day class, um, and what I found out was that I wasn't a half full glass kind of person and I wasn't a half empty glass kind of person. I'm the kind of person that I have to figure out how long do I have to stand there and hold the glass? How long can I stand here with this glass while people are putting more water in it before I need to go get another glass? And before I turn around I'm standing in water and the next thing you know I'm dropping the glass and somebody else is giving me another glass. And so I know that through these MRT process, this application of these skills, and all of us have these skills, but I didn't have this application process. But now, knowing that and having known that, my, I know this for honest truth, my personal manage of my personal stress would have been handled completely different. I would have been a much healthier, much more effective, much more pro productive, um, and way less crazy, truly. So anyhow, I also learned the difference in keeping going and moving forward. Because you can keep going. I mean, I, everybody keeps going, keep going, get through, I'll get through, I'll get through it. But, you know, I'd have a disaster occur and I would be right back where I was two years ago dealing with that situation with those same emotions. So, truthfully now, I stop now. I process that stress when it happens. I don't hold the glass anymore. I'm going to put that glass down. Not doing. No glasses for me. Not going to do it. And I don't take on tomorrow until I'm finished with today. And that's huge. For some people, when you're trying to do everything all at once, you know, you're holding the glass, you're watching kids, you're doing carpool, got an FRG meeting, you're waiting for the phone to buzz in case your husband calls in, checks one, texts with you, you stop everything while you're holding the glass. And pretty soon you're just overwhelmed. But I'm telling you right now, if you get an opportunity to take the class, take the class. It will change, I mean, truly. And I've had people tell me, mm, I took it, when, 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 nothing revolutionary. I'm like, congratulations, you're resilient, I'm not. I'm better, I'm building, it's a process. Some days I'm more resilient than I am others. And some disasters aren't nearly as bad as I thought they were, but still, Processing, I'm sorry, processing that stress as it happens is what's really important. And I encourage young spouses and encourage young families, if you're really in trouble, it may not be the thing that's going to help you, but it will sure keep you from getting there. So again, thank you AUSA for inviting me. Thank you, Patty, my longtime dear friend, for including me. And I want to thank you all for your attention. And now we're going to hear from Dr. Scaraldi, Dr. Glenn Scaraldi. Good morning. I'm 
Glenn Chiraldi, and it's really an honor to uh, speak with you who serve in, in so many ways. Um, I'd like to take a few of our, our precious moments that we have today and, and basically address three questions. Um, one is, what actually is this misunderstood thing we call resilience? Second, what are the key coping skills that each of us need, whether we're a spouse or a soldier, deployed or at home? And third, how do we build these skills so that we're prepared to cope with whatever life throws at us? Um, just a little bit of quick background. Um, I'm a West Pointer, Vietnam era vet. Uh, I've served over the last 30 plus years on three stress management faculties at the Pentagon, the International Critical Incident Stress Foundation, and the University of Maryland. Over that time period, I've uh, written a number of books, um, including uh, some of these that are up here. Uh, the one on the bottom right is, is on the nature and treatment of, of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. The three on the top are about resilience training. Resilience is a key focus throughout our services, and the question is why? Well, you and I uh, both are aware that our soldiers and families face a wide range of stress conditions, um, and we understand that these occur because people aren't prepared emotionally. We prepare people wonderfully tactically, but not emotionally necessarily to deal with the adversities they face. And many of these adversities are not just war related. For example, 75% um, of our suicides um, are people who have either never deployed or are deployed uh, once. People come into the service with many unresolved wounds. Some uh, experience military sexual uh, trauma. Um, the solution, as the Secretary of Defense has articulated, is, uh, is resilience. Um, comprehensive resilience training builds skills that are wide enough and deep enough to help people deal with whatever life throws uh, at them. Once we can strengthen people to, to deal with a, a wide range of problems, then we uh, minimize their suffering. We also ease the, the burden on a, an already overloaded behavioral health system. So um, what is this thing that we call resilience? If, if you put together the eight plus definitions that are floating around and we come up with a working definition that looks something like this. Resilience is those inner strengths, both of mind and of character, inborn and capable of being developed that not only prevent but also promote recovery from all the stress-related problems we, we talked about. But it goes beyond that. It's, it's also uh, helping people perform and, and uh, function at their best um, throughout life. If we feel our best mentally, because the mind and body are connected, we also perform better. Um, and so we expect less absenteeism, being able to stay in the job and, and our marriages longer. If you study people who have been found to be resilient, both children and adults, they present with a handful of strengths that are on this, this slide here. I completed a study of 41 resilient, well-adjusted combat survivors from World War II, um, traveling in the country over a five-year period to interview these people. And these people um, made resilience come alive. And so what are the timeless lessons we learn from these people and what do we gain from their inspiring stories? I'd like to just briefly share a few lessons and I'll tell you how the, these strengths can be uh, strengthened in, in each of us. Um, Irene Updike was a survivor of uh, <coughs> World War II. She was a nursing student in uh, Poland when Hitler attacked in 1939. After she bandaged the the carnage, she volunteered to flee to the Ukraine with the Polish army. Um, there she was captured by the Russians, raped and left for dead in the snow. Somebody found her, dragged her uh, to a hospital where she was nearly raped again by a, a hospital administrator. After a year in hiding, she went back to Poland to try to find her family. She was conscripted as a slave laborer in a, a German munitions factory. Um, where a German Major Rugemer said, you are beautiful, you look Aryan, you speak perfect German because she had grown up on the border with, with uh, Germany. You will serve our officers who are quartered in the hotel. There she begins her um, uh, resistance activity, stealing food every day from the kitchen and, and uh, 
uh, hiding in under the ghetto wall, uh, eventually persuading the major that she needed help uh, and allowed 12 uh, Jews from the ghetto to help in the hotel. She eventually uh, preserved their lives from the Gestapo by hiding them in the, in the very basement of the villa where the major was living and where she kept house upstairs. Uh, eventually the major discovered what she was doing and was furious but said, Irene, I've come to respect you. I won't kill you nor your Jewish friends, but you must become my mistress. And so she had to do that in secret until she was able to finally help each of those Jews escape to the forest by hiding them in a hay wagon and she eventually escaped herself. Um, here you see her later in life, <coughs> um, the top middle, she's visiting her sisters in Poland in 1972. Um, on the right is with her husband, William Updike, who um, was actually a UN ambassador who discovered her in a uh, repatriation camp where she, Irene was hid, hidden by her Jewish friends and stayed for three years um, because the Russians were still after her. Um, these people that I interviewed, and here's the lesson, were motivated by profound love and meaning and not by hate. Um, she said, I knew from a very young age my, my purpose in, in life was to save lives, even if I should die. She said, I'd already forgiven the major when I escaped because after all, he'd been kind to my Jewish friends. Uh, she couldn't hate all Germans, she said, because there are many examples of goodness. For example, a kindly uh, German army cook named Schultz uh, was good to her. And she said, Schultz knew what I was doing, but he couldn't let on that he knew what I was doing. For example, I said, Sergeant Schultz, my sister and I are very cold. Could you please give us some blankets? Schultz gave them not just two blankets, but 14, enough for all of her Jewish friends working in the, in the hotel. And she said throughout her life, she tried to convince talking to children around the world to love and, and not hate. Um, Russell Dunham was a Medal of Honor winner. Um, only member of his family who did not become an alcoholic, although he had many uh, reasons to become so. Very thoughtful man. Here you see him in Arlington with his Medal of Honor. He was born in a boxcar uh, to a sickly mother who died when he was seven. Um, his abusive stepmother kicked him out of the house at 16, and then he did what a lot of people do. Um, he joined the army seeking a sense of family. But he said in those early years he was a jailbird, a screw-up, avoiding responsibility, until something profound happened in his life. He was fighting off the boot of Italy when he was in literally two units that were decimated, 90% casualties. Finally, the officer said, Dunham, if you don't accept responsibility and accept sergeant stripes, we're going to court-martial you for dereliction of duty. Um, he said, I was grateful for that opportunity to lead. I, I knew I was a good soldier, but I I became a good leader and a good man. <clears throat> About his Medal of Honor, um, he, he said um, he single-handedly left his platoon at the foot of a, a snow-covered hill and, <clears throat> and wiped out three machine gun emplacements and the supporting rifle uh, foxholes. <clears throat> but he said a lot of people think um, when you get your Medal of Honor, you go berserk. He said, you have to be thinking every single moment and aware or else you get killed. He said, thinking about my men uh, is what kept me focused. And profoundly, and here's this theme that you don't read in the psychology books, resilient survivors have profound love. Uh, of this he said, you can't explain the bond that forms between comrades in arms. I had a lot of respect for my men. I cared for them as a private. I was inseparable from my friends. Returning to my unit after being wounded was like returning home, the only one I had at the time. I had tears in my eyes when I said goodbye to them at the end of the war. You needed your friends before, during, and after the battle. I'm sure my friends uh, in the hospital helped m me make it through my rehabilitation. Resilient survivors beautifully harmonize dignity and self-esteem and humility, and no one perhaps um, uh, incorporated these, these strengths than Tuskegee Airman Charles Edward McGee, member of the famed 332nd Fighter Group who's um, had the unprecedented distinction of never losing a, a bomber while under uh, fighter escort in over 200 missions. He flew more combined fighter pilot uh, missions in three wars than any other uh, U.S. pilot and is highly decorated. If you've ever known Jackie Robinson, you get a sense of the dignity, the grace of this man. Tremendous leader, father, and uh, spouse. Um, I asked him 
how did you bear how did you bear the indignities of the war on prejudice while he fought the world uh, the the uh, war World War II, and of this he said. My father had taught me that all people are truly equal, created in God's image. I'd learned that if you bear humiliation with, with dignity, you might later earn the person's respect. I believe in the promise of America. And he said, one day walking down the streets of Rome with a white squadron officer, thinking about prejudice, he said, why don't you tell people you're Egyptian? There's less prejudice uh, for Egyptians. And what he said was remarkable. He said, I thought for a moment and replied, I'm American, I don't need to be Egyptian. It never crossed my mind that I needed to be somebody else or something different. I was comfortable with who I was and what I'd accomplished, walking upright, hopefully, before God. I didn't need to be something else to please a few. And then profoundly, a lot of people do a lot of stumbling trying to be something they're not. A man of very deep and quiet faith and, and morality. And here's another strength of resilient survivors. This is a very moral group. They spoke of chaste courtships and fidelity. Roy Freitag, a um, tank commander fighting up the boot of Italy, not much with words, but he said, um, as we rolled into the Italian towns, there are many opportunities with the Italian women. I'd been married six months. I kept myself clean. Um, these people, it was out of the question to mistreat, to rape, to mistreat uh, civilians or, or POWs. Another theme we see in the resilient is a lack of bitterness, lasting bitterness toward the enemy. They were just people with a different view. Robert Vanover, for example, very kindly man with a twinkle in his eye. Um, he was in a unit in um, the Battle of the Bulge that was literally decimated. Uh, he said, but I never fired my rifle in anger only as duty required, and then you near weep for the friend you might have made. <coughs> Vernon Tipton was very poor during the Depression, and then when his father died, he was even poorer. His bomber was shot down. He spent nearly a year in Stilaglof III in a, in a prison camp. When the Germans force marched them on, on frostbitten feet, he said, I was very warmed when I felt, walking through a German town, a hand go into my pocket in my coat. And I looked around, and it was an elderly woman giving me a potato. And he said, here's a German woman, my enemy, um, also probably suffering with meager rations. But I was always warned by that. After the war, his next-door neighbor and best friend was a Wehrmacht vet who drove an American car. Tipton drove a German car. <coughs> okay. Uh, DeMarco uh, basically said um, to... Uh, a sergeant when they captured a machine gun team of German youth who's, the sergeant said, DeMarco, you only have to kill these four, I'll kill the other five. He turned his rifle and said, on the sergeant said, I'll kill you first. They surrendered, they could have killed us. Um, many more examples I wish we could share. This one was a tough Marine who, who figured out a way to, to uh, cry the loss of his brother who was killed beside him. Uh, sob over the brave Marines that died in battle and then go back to, to duty. But he had a way to, to deal with these emotions. Now, the answer, can we change resilience? And the answer is yes. At the University of Maryland, we have a course that we uh, basically functional people, and they met twice a week and every day taught skills and principles, practiced them, went home and, and did them as homework. We came back and tweaked and reinforced. Um, but we found that you don't just get resilient by, by information. You have to practice skills. Um, it's a little bit like golf, and you have to keep practicing to retain those skills. The, the skill areas were half dealing with the really bad stuff and half dealing with the, the beautiful strengths that we just talked about. We start, um, and by the way, everything changed that we measured from resilience to happiness to reductions in the bad stuff like depression. We start with the brain. Um, we know that stress and aging, particularly combat, uh, cause deterioration in key structures of the brain, but we can optimize brain hardware by using the, the recent research that's very trainable, <coughs> including reducing uh, medical destroyers like apnea, uh, high blood pressure, cholesterol, that's easily treated and, and sometimes profoundly improves uh, mood. We then moved into critical warrior skills, and I just have time to highlight a very few of those. Um, people need to be taught how to manage 
strong, distressing, inevitable emotions. Because if they don't, then fear and, and guilt and, and uh, grief tend to build up like a pressure cooker and explode in domestic violence and suicide and so forth. Um, so we need to prepare people with ways, and this is very uh, doable. Likewise, people come back from war with or without PTSD with, with persistent nightmares. This is very easy to train people how to bring those nightmares and settle them. Likewise, guilt, probably the number, one of the number one uh, causes of PTSD. People often say, I came home, nobody prepared me to see an innocent looking child with a suicide vest or see my buddy blown up. Um, we need to emotionally inoculate people for that stuff, just like we train people in advance tactically for what they're going to face. Uh, we need to do a better job of inoculating people uh, to kill, um, to distinguish the joy of doing your duty, from, which is healthy, from the joy of killing, which is not, to distinguish thou shalt not kill to its more correct uh, biblical translation, thou shalt not murder. And because people are going to make mistakes, we need to train people to maintain their inner peace or regain it when even sometimes good soldiers under stress lose that inner peace. We end up with the strengths and skills of happiness, which again have been well found to be trainable. And when people are happier, they tend to fall less often and recover faster and perform better. Um, so. Uh, where do we find skills? There, there are books written about it. Um, that's one I wrote. Uh, this is the one written for uh, warriors before, during, and after war. Sometimes a warrior will not read, but a spouse will. And like one Navy SEAL wife told me, you can, you can talk about these things together. These can be put in reading rooms or shared buddy to buddy. Um, this is the one that has the stories on, uh, that we just shared on uh, World War II combat survivors. I'd like to leave you with a final image. I have this in my office. Um, it is Colonel McGee, the Tuskegee Airman, with his gold medal from the president. Um, and I put that up as a reminder that you can retain your humility and your integrity and still get ahead as he has done. Um, at the very last line there is my uh, contact information. Please don't hesitate to call me with questions. Um, there is a resource list of, re of resilience and happiness and stress management. It looks like it made it to the back table. If you can't find it there, please come up afterwards. I got a few extra or uh, email me and I'll, I'll send you an uh, electronic copy. Thank you very much and thank you for what you do. That was absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we're, we're running a little short on time, so I think we only really have time for one question. I apologize for that. However, we are keeping track of the questions because you're writing them down on cards, and our virtual delegates are going to be sending them in. And we will be posting the answers to the questions on our, our website uh, shortly after the forum. So this first question is from the, it's a virtual delegate question from Fort Hood. Um, and she was asking about man spouses, Wayne. How can they connect with manning the home front? They can go to our Facebook. Is this on? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, they can go to our Facebook page, manning the home front at, on Facebook. Uh, that, that's the best way. We are trying to set up a local group in, at Fort Hood. We do have currently three guys there now. It's just getting them to connect is the difficulty. And uh, a question from the floor. Can someone raise their card if you have a question? Yes. That was a wonderful comment about the panel being exceptional and that a Wayne Perry in, her, in the uh, speaker's eyes um, in this time when so many men are leaving their families to her, Wayne is a real man. So that was that. Thank you so much. We're going to um, give our wonderful panelists another round of applause. And I also, I also have a couple of gifts for all of you and then we'll be bringing up the next panel.